you're going to see today is as close as we could restore it back to what it was when the Vales moved in in 1881. Harvey Vale and his wife Sevilla originally were from back east, New York in fact, and Mr. Vale made most of his money because he had the mail contract with the U.S. government. He delivered mail to all points west of St. Louis, including the Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon, and the California Trail. He didn't just make his money that way. He was a lawyer, had taught school, had been a newspaper man. He also invested in cattle ranches in Oklahoma and Texas. When they moved in in 1881, Mrs. Vale was 47 years old. Mr. Vale was four years older than her. Tragically, she died just 18 months later of an overdose of laudanum. Mr. Vale never remarried. He remained a widower until his own death in 1894. There was quite a fight over his will. However, by 1910, the mansion was a nursing home and remained a nursing home for 71 years. The very last owner of the house, Mrs. Mildred DeWitt, who unfortunately never got to live in the mansion, she gave the house to the city of Independence when she died in 1983. The restorations were paid for by government grants in the late 1980s and the 1990s. However, that all dried up by the turn of the century. And so now one of our main goals is the Vale Victorian Society. We take care, we maintain the inside of the house and the City of Independence takes care of the structural integrity. So let's go on in and take a look. We're gonna start our tour in the ladies' parlor. This is the largest room of 31 rooms in this mansion. I wanna point out to you the tete-a-tete. This is a pink velvet tete-a-tete it was very important for us to get this because after Mr. Vale's death, the discussion over his will, they had a big auction in 1901 and items were sold. Probate court had inventoried the house room by room and we have a copy of that. And there actually was a pink velvet tete-a-tete -tete listed in the inventory. Now in Victorian times, young separate men and women were never allowed to sit on the same piece of furniture, only married couples. So leave it to the French to invent a chair for lovers. And so this became very popular. Above the tete-a-tete, -tete, you see the chandelier. This is one of three original chandeliers that we have in the mansion. It is a twin to the one that you will see later in the gentleman's parlor. The story goes that Mr. Vale was able to secure these two chandeliers from the White House. They had been intended for the White House and because of some flaw, which we've never been privy to, uh, they were refused, and so he bought them while he was in Washington, D.C. Originally, these were gasoliers. Mr. Vale actually had his own gas well, and in fact, the gas well was used up until the 1940s, after it had even become a nursing home. Everything was converted to electricity sometime between 1920 and 1930. The drapes, our restoration committee worked very hard to make sure that these were authentic and the very top of the line because of course the veils would have had some. I particularly want to mention the tie backs. They are made of paisley. Now paisley was something that was reserved actually almost just for royalty when it was first discovered. Uh, paisley had been imported from Kashmir but actually the design goes clear back to the Persian days. Paisley Scotland had some smart young person figured out a loom that could weave the paisley design and after that it became more affordable not cheap, but more affordable. And so that was what most wealthy people in the 1880s and 1890s, that's what everybody wanted to have. Now we're gonna move and look at our white Carrara marble fireplace. Mm -hmm. There are nine marble fireplaces in the house. They're all original and they're all different. None of them are exactly the same. This is the white Carrara Italian marble, and it's probably the most detailed of all of the fireplaces in the house. The panel that you see underneath the mantle and then the pillars are made of pink onyx. And supposedly, when there was a fire going, they would glow with the pink glow. 
there are three different wine motifs that are carved into the marble here. And particularly, I want to call your attention to, on either of the corners, you will see two little hands. Each hand is holding a champagne glass, and they are toasting each other. And just in case you don't know for sure, there's a bubble. They are drinking champagne. And you're going to see the rest of the fireplaces, and they're all different. I think you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the gentleman's parlor, also the green parlor. Uh, this was the parlor where the men would gather when the women and the women would go to the pink parlor. They could shut these pocket doors and smoke and talk politics, which you did not do in front of the ladies. Uh, the fireplace here is original. There's nine of them in the house. This one is chocolate model marble from either Georgia or Missouri. It has onyx pillars. It's a coal fireplace, not a wood fireplace, which means the box is smaller and it has a metal plate in front of it. Above it, you see a picture of by painting by William Holbrook Baird, who was famous in uh, the 1800s for pictures of animals acting like people. This one's called the Dancing Bears. Painted this supposedly uh, something to do with Wall Street, but it inspired a song called If You Go Down in the Woods Today, You Better Not Go Alone. It's lovely down in the woods today, but it's safer to stay at home. The walls here in this parlor are green. Uh, during the nursing home years, they papered the walls. Well, they took the paper down and found that the original walls were painted, and this green was the original color, and this was supposedly Mr. Uh, Vale's favorite color. The shutters on the windows are original. Uh, they're made of cypress, which their cypress is resistant to rot and insects. The nursing home took the shutters down and put them up in the attic, and when the city went to replace them, they found that the windows aren't all the same size. And so it became a big puzzle what shutters went where. They, there's still some windows in the house. They couldn't figure out what shutters went there. So there's still some up in the attic. The mirrors on the wall here were made in France in the late 1700s. And they came up the Mississippi and Missouri River to a mansion in Lexington, Missouri. They are made by a process called diamond dust back. It's nothing to do with diamond dust. It's because it looks like that on the backside. But it's silver, and silver doesn't spread evenly, so they mix it with mercury to make it spread. And that's highly toxic, so you don't do that anymore. But after all these years, they're still very clear. We have two other mirrors in the house made by the same process. Uh, if you put an object up against the mirror, there'll be a gap between the reflection and the object, and that's how you can tell that it's diamond dust back. Imagine being invited to dinner in this beautiful mansion and then entertained in this room afterwards. This is the music room of the Victorian Vale Mansion. In this room, we have a beautiful square grand chickering piano. These were only made during the Victorian era from about 1860 to 1901, and then they were discontinued after that time. They were beautiful instruments to look at, but terrible instruments to play because of the mechanism inside. They had to be tuned quite often. In this room, we also have a dulcimer, we have a violin, and we have a beautiful Victorian music box. Now, young Victorian ladies were not taught so much science, math, or history. That wasn't considered important. But what was important was that they learned etiquette and the fine arts, because that would turn them into a refined lady, a suitable wife, and worthy of a home such as this. This beautiful Brazilian rosewood chickering square grand piano was donated to the Vale Mansion in 2019 by a very generous benefactor. Now the chickering was sort of the precursor to the Steinway Grand. There was a concert at Carnegie Hall in New York and Mr. Steinway happened to be there and he was working on this new design for a piano. He didn't come to hear the opera singer. He came to see the piano that was on stage, which was a chickering grand at that time. And it's said that after the concert was over, he nearly rushed the stage and examined every square inch of the chickering. And it is today what we know as the Steinway Grand. In this corner of the music room, we have this wonderful pump organ. It is German in origin. It's an 1883 Etsy Grand Salon pump organ. So you have to play it 
while pumping it. The bellows are in wonderful condition. It has been completely restored and it sounds just wonderful and airy during our Victorian funeral customs event that we hold each October. This is a lovely Victorian music box. Um, we have a lot of discs for this music box. I'll point one out here. They're flat on the top, but if you turn them over, they're quite sharp because the mechanism in this actually plucks them like a music box would. Um, so to entertain your guest, you would simply wind it and then you would turn it on. Now that, of course, is the beautiful Blue Danube Waltz. As I said, we have quite a large collection. There is one disc in here called I Don't Want No Cheap Man, which I think is very apropos for this home. I'd like to point out the beautiful chandelier here in the music room of the Vale. It is original to the home, which means it's been here since 1881. It was originally a gasolier because there was a natural gas well on the property. You can still see the original keys, which adjusted the amount of gas coming to the fixture. Over here we have this beautiful blue-gray Vermont marble fireplace. Um, it does have the grape cluster in the corner because six of the nine fireplaces in this house have some reference to wine on them. Above the fireplace is a portrait of a young girl. We know from the signature that he was a traveling artist in the area. Now these traveling artists would spend the long cold winters in their studios and they would paint just bodies. And when the weather broke, he would load all these canvases that he had painted all winter long into his cart and he would hit up all the affluent neighborhoods in the area. And he would ask mom or dad, would you like your child's portrait painted? By just having to paint on the head at each location, the artist could save time and move from home to home, make more money so that he could feed himself during the winter. Welcome to the dining room of the Vale Mansion. This is the first place in the mansion where you see the transition of wood in, in the mansion. There are many different varieties of wood represented in the home. In actuality, they are all soft pine, which are faux painted. Now, the Vales were very proud of that fact because after all, who else could afford to hire the artisans to come over from Europe and faux paint the wood in your home? Now, um, in the first four parlors, you see the very dark walnut. In this room, we see light feathered maple. The dinner parties that were held here were no doubt very elegant. Um, and the Vales had no children, so they didn't need a huge dining room. Mostly they entertained dignitaries because this home was a stopover for representatives and ambassadors and senators who were traveling to Washington, D.C. or traveling back home from Washington, D.C. The ceiling in this beautiful room is an actual representation of the estate. To this end were the beautiful greenhouses that the Vales were quite famous for. We have the lake, which had a little island in the middle that the Vales could actually row out to for a picnic. Mr. Vales' love of wine is echoed in this ceiling. He has the grape leaves and the grape bunches, but also the Latin phrase, in vino veritas, which translates to, in wine there is truth. He also gave homage to the natural springs that are on the property with the uh, phrase in aqua sanitas, which means um, in water there is health. It was Mrs. Vale's wildest desire to be a member of high society when she moved to independence. Unfortunately, that did not happen for her. In the 18 short months that she lived in this home before her death, Records show that she was never invited to the other ladies' homes and never had the other ladies come into her home. There were a couple of reasons for this. Um, one was that the Vales were very staunch abolitionists living in a slave state. And the second reason was probably that they were very wealthy and they were building the largest home in the county and people may have been a little jealous of their money. This is the Grand Hall of the mansion. For anyone visiting in the Vale's time, or even today, this is the first impression you would receive when you walked through the front doors of the house. Now, 
as you've heard, all of the wood in the house is white pine that has been painted to look like other wood grains. The one exception is this staircase. The staircase is actually made out of black walnut, which is a much stronger wood and much more appropriate for a staircase. Now we're gonna move down the hall and talk about the various owners of the mansion over the years. We'll start with the Vales, the people who built the mansion. Here we have Sophia Vale. The paintings are contemporary, but we think that the photo it's based on was taken by Matthew Brady, who was a famous Civil War photographer. He had studios in Washington, D.C. and New York City. We also have Mr. Vale over here, Harvey. They look like they have a tremendous age difference between them, but in actuality, they were only four years apart. When they got married, she was 27 and he was 31. We just don't have a photo of him from that time. So he's about 62 uh, in this image. Uh, it was painted by a local painter who included some of the details. We talked about in the ladies' parlor, the fireplace, the clock on the mantel. So she included those details in the background. This is Carrie Mae Carroll. She actually married one of the relatives of Mr. Vale, and she was in charge of the house when it was run as a sanitarium and nursing home, which it was for the majority of its existence. She actually lived on the property for almost 50 years. When Carrie Mae Carroll passed away, she and her husband hadn't had any children either. So again, the house was left without anyone to inherit it. In 1962, there was threat that it might be demolished. This couple, Roger and Mary Mildred DeWitch, saved the house from demolition. They bought it at an auction for $60,000 cash. Their plan was to let it continue to be a nursing home while they restored the exterior of the house. Then when they were finished with the exterior, they would move in, it would cease being a nursing home and they could work on restoring the interior. However, Mr. DeWitt died unexpectedly, so they were never able to do that. And Mrs. DeWitt never lived on the premises either. They did do extensive restoration to the outside of the house, including the slate roof and chimney caps. And shortly before her death in 1983, Mrs. DeWitt willed the house to the city of Independence. This room was originally Sophia's sitting room. It was designed so she could sit at the windows, view the lake that was at the north end of the property, while enjoying a nice warm glow from the Carrera marble fireplace. We know for certain that this was Sophia's by looking at the ceiling. Now this is one of the most detailed ceilings in the mansion and it has some very distinctive Victorian symbolism in it. It has peacock feathers, which symbolized loyalty and longevity. It had the cherubs, which were traditional for joy and love. The interesting thing about these three cherubs is one of them was painted over shortly after Harvey Vale passed away. It was not discovered again until there was some unfortunate water damage to the ceiling. And when that damage was repaired, the third cherub was found without wings, which is very unusual for a Victorian cherub. These wardrobes had a beautiful security function in that behind the side trim, if you open it up, you could unlock all the drawers or lock them to make it a more secure place to store your belongings. Some of these today that we find are lined with felt and were used to store the family silver. Now, since we're talking about dressers and clothing, I'm gonna bring you over here to the closet. Now the veils were very innovative in their housing design. This is a summer winter closet and these were put in the upstairs rooms rather than using the traditional freestanding wardrobes. What makes it a summer winter closet is it has two levels. So when the seasons changed, you could switch the clothes out and put the clothes that were more readily needed for this season in the bottom where they were more easily accessible. One of the things I love about this closet is the original hooks are actually still in it and you can actually see the little intricate detail of the acorns that were cast into the hooks when they were originally made. We are now in actually the most technologically advanced room in the house. To give you a little bit of history, the Vales moved into this house in 1881. Public works departments didn't exist 
In fact, they didn't even have a water department anywhere in this region until 1884, and they didn't have sewage systems in the city until 1895. So this house that was designed in 1870 was designed with not one, but two full and sweet bathrooms on the second floor, which was a very big deal for several reasons. One was they had to get water here. So the Vales were very lucky on this count. The Vale estate had multiple springs on the land. To the south of the house, there was a spring that used a windmill to carry the water into a water tower that was two stories tall and inside the house. It was two stories tall to provide the water pressure needed to take a bath on the second floor without carrying water up and down the stairs. The second issue you have is where does it go when it leaves the bathroom? We believe they built a septic system on the property and that would make it one of the first in the United States. Now, once you have the water and the septic taken care of, you need the fixtures. Here, we have a beautiful copper bath, which was opulent and we know made to be shown off for several reasons. One, if you had a copper bath such as this with the seams, you had to have servants to clean it and keep it from turning that green patina and protect it and dry it from the Missouri weather. Also, this bathroom has two doors, the one that you see here and the one that you're looking through. That meant from the hallway, guests could view this beautiful bathroom. So at a time when 99.9% .9 of people in this part of the country were bathing in a wash basin on the kitchen floor with water carried in, the veils were bathing in copper tubs with hot and cold running water out of silver taps, which is kind of amazing for the time. The other amazing thing in this bathroom is the toilet. I know it doesn't sound fancy and most people don't want to talk about toilets, but it really was a sanitary marvel at the time. The particular toilet that's in this house is called the National. It was created in 1879, which was two years before the Vales moved into the house. So if it was created two years before, why is it amazing that it's in this house? Well, the construction of the house started in 1871. And for this particular toilet, you needed to have water running to it, waste running away from it, and a vent. You needed a vent because at the time there was the risk of gas building up and your toilet exploding and theirs did not. This entire bathroom was actually restored in the 90s. And just like the trim in the rest of the house, you can see the wainscoting in this room is stained two different colors to make it look like it was two different woods. It was a lot of work and we're very grateful to the folks that did it for us. Now, as you can see, this house was a marvel of the intellect. Not only was it exquisitely beautiful, but it was one of the most technologically advanced homes in the whole country. Welcome to the master bedroom. Like the gentleman's parlor downstairs, the room is green, which was Colonel Vale's favorite color. Once again, we have a white Carrera marble fireplace. And I'd like to point out the bed on the other side of the room. Our Victorian bed is an actual full-size double bed it looks small, but that's because of the headboard. Although I'm sure the bed might have been small for Colonel Vale, who I understand stood over six feet tall. Above the bed, we have a painting named Innocence Awakening. She was originally naked from the waist up in 1881. A newspaper reporter came out and reported on this magnificent home in Northern Independence, and he mentioned the naked picture of Mrs. Vale on the ceiling in the master bedroom. That is not Sophie. It nearly ruined her reputation with the local society. She insisted that Harvey get the original Italian artist back to cover her up. Well, she's almost covered. Sadly, Sophie suffered from stomach cancer. She was also extremely worried about Harvey, who in 1882 
was accused of stealing money from the government on his many mail routes. They were called back to Washington, D.C. and put on trial for mail fraud. Sophie was left alone, and while Harvey was in D.C., on Valentine's Day in 1883, she took six milligrams of laudanum. That was a mixture of morphine, opium, and alcohol and she died the next morning. We do not know if it was an accidental overdose of her prescribed medicine or if she was actually committing suicide because she was afraid of being left alone in the house. Harvey was notified and was allowed to come home for one month for the funeral, but he had to go back to DC. He was still on trial and it wasn't until April or May that he was found innocent of all charges and allowed to come home but he came home to an empty house. He never remarried. And 11 years later, on June 4th, 1894, Harvey passed away in this room after suffering a series of strokes. Thank you for visiting the master bedroom and enjoy the rest of your tour. This room is pretty unique. It was called Nature's Bower back in the Vales day. Uh, it has stars on a blue ceiling still. It would have had a green carpeting at their time to represent heaven and earth. And supposedly it was Mr. Vale's favorite room in the mansion. As you've heard already, most of the mansion is painted in faux bois, the fake wood grain painting technique. In this room, they take that to a new level. Mr. Vale actually decided while having the wood grain painted that his artist should paint little faces in the room. We have animals as well as people represented. Um, at one point, someone actually counted the number of faces and it was over 350 faces that were depicted in this room. The story goes that Mr. Vale would invite his business associates to come up here and they would sit in this room and they'd have a glass of wine, maybe a couple glasses of wine, and then his hope was that the associate would start to see things in the woodwork. We also have, in addition to all of the faces, the artist painted his signature above the window and it's dated with the date of October 12th, 1881, which is right around the time that Harvey and Sophia moved into the mansion. Welcome to the library. This is the room in which Colonel Vell conducted his business as well as attended to the affairs of his estate. This room, like others throughout the mansion, has the beautifully hand-painted wood graining appearing here in silver oak and bird's eye maple. On either side of the east-facing window are two original bookshelves reaching from the floor to the ceiling. We know from auction records that the Vells had ex an extensive library ranging from classic literature to history and even to cattle breeding. On the opposite side of the room sits the fireplace. This fireplace features American chocolate malted marble. To the left of the fireplace, we have a wall niche, which was quite popular in Victorian homes. In the Vell's day, we believe this particular one to have housed the Venus de Milo because the Vells were such lovers of art. This room is among my favorite because of the celebration of education, knowledge, and Mr. Vell's love of winemaking, as seen in the leaf motifs around the room, including the fireplace, as well as the ceiling. The hand-painted leaves on the ceiling create a border around the room, joining together in the South Bay window in an education-inspired motif. Here we find a artist palette and brushes in celebration of art, a book in celebration of knowledge, a globe in celebration of travel, a triangle in celebration of architecture, and a harp representing music. Hi, welcome to the Vale landscape. I want to share with you the history and the present day jobs that we are working on at the Vale. Originally, the house sat on over 600 acres and of that 600 acres, 10 of the acres were made into formal gardens. There was a greenhouse. Beyond that was the spring house, which fed a lot of the fountains that were on the grounds. 
there was a pond that was several acres in size on the north side of the house and to that pond there was a double row of sugar maples so that you could be in the shade as you went to the lake. Around the lake there was a boathouse and there was a gazebo. Middle of the lake was a small island that had a weeping willow on it and that was used through Mr. Vale's life and also the first several years of the sanitarium. There were barns, there was a pergola, uh, there was also a couple cottages for some of the hired help that worked on the grounds. Currently the house is maintained by volunteers and we also have volunteers that maintain the grounds. Several years ago uh, we decided to re reinstall the pond that we thought was a reflecting pool but turned out to be a fountain and for two weeks we had the help of the Kansas City Archaeological Society. The very last day uh, we got to the very bottom and found that there was an overflow and a fill and we were able to identify a tiered fountain that was in place rather than just the reflecting pool. We replanted the double row of sugar maples that would have gone down to the lake. We also have a state champion smoke tree. We have three other trees that are Kansas City area champions. We are fortunate to have a few of the original sugar maples from the double row. But other than that, we have just tried to bring back plants that would have been here during his lifetime using plants that were popular in the 1880s, 1890s. We are always looking for, for experienced help, if possible. So come visit the Vale, enjoy the grounds, and thank you. It's time to say goodbye. We hope you've enjoyed this tour. You've seen most of what we have in the house, but if you come in person, there's a lot of more details that you'll be able to see. We are open at various hours and you can always check our website. The days that we are open, we're open from 10 to 4 on weekdays and Saturday, and then we're open 1 to 4 on Sundays. Also want to mention that at Christmas time, we open the day after Thanksgiving and we are just, it's beautiful. So you need to come and see that. I'm glad you've joined us today and I'll say goodbye. You want me to sing it now? Yeah. If you go down in the woods today, you better not go alone. It's lovely down in the woods today, but safer to stay at home. For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain, because today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. Picnic time for teddy bears. The little teddy bears are having a lovely time today. Watch them, catch them unaware and see them picnic on their holiday see them gaily get about they love to play and shout they're having a lovely time at six o'clock their mommies and daddies will take them home to bed because they're tired little teddy bears <laughs>